You're listening to the Hello World podcast number nine. My name is Sean Wildermuth and I'm your host. The Hello World podcast is where you can hear from some of your favorite developers, authors, and speakers about how they got started in this business. They'll go way back to their first computer, their first code experience, and their first job. Today my guest is Glenn Block. Glenn is a product manager for Splunk's developer experience. In his spare time, he is also the author and maintainer of ScriptCS, an open source tool for C-sharp scripting. A hardcore coder professionally for almost 20 years, he cares deeply about making developers' lives easier. Previously, Glenn worked at Microsoft, where he kick-started ASP.NET Web API and spearheaded Microsoft's Node.js story on Azure. Glenn is an active contributor to Node.js and .NET open source projects a supporter of the community, and a frequent speaker internationally on software development. He's also a bit of a web API fanatic and is the author of a new O'Reilly book on the subject. He lives with his wife and daughter in Seattle, where rain and caffeine are aplenty. I love catching up with Glenn because he's always thinking about twice the speed I am. He's always in a frenetic pace to help find the next new interesting thing for developers. Hope you'll enjoy the story of how he got started. I'd like to uh, welcome Glenn Block to my uh, Hello World podcast. How are you doing this morning, Glenn? Uh, aside from being tired, I'm good. <laughs> I woke you up early, didn't I? <laughs> yes, anything earlier than 11 is early for me. No, no it's actually not quite that bad, but, yeah. but, but, but 7 o'clock is pretty early for me. As you know, uh, this podcast is all about you know how you got started and your first computer and all that. What you know, at what age did you start playing with computers? Uh, I was seven. Wow! So I was a very early, uh, early entry into working with computers. Um, I remember this story really clearly. Um, so I was seven years old, and nobody in my family was into computers. So this was not like a Glenn growing up in the family of computer geeks. I was the first. (laughs) Um, And a friend of mine got a TRS-80 Model 1. Uh, So I'm dating myself. Yeah, you Um, don't look that old. (laughs) Yeah, I am going to be 40. I am am 42. So um, you look great. I'm older than I look. (laughs) Although I'm getting grayer and grayer. Um, you've probably had something to do with that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I did. I don't doubt that at all. <laughs> all those B, B author jokes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, nobody will understand what that is, but, but you and I know what I'm, that is. I'm fine with, with odd asides that are only between you and I. So, um, my friend got a TRS-80 model one and my, what his dad was in the army. So they brought home a computer. Um, and I remember I went over there and I think we played like Zork and Ultima one. And I was just like, wow, this thing is awesome. So at seven years old, for some reason, and nothing prompted this in terms of my family or anything, um, I went into the library and got a book on computer literacy and there was a book for kids. I remember it really clearly. It was this white book. Um, I don't know. It's probably still around, but it had drawings in it and it was really geared towards teaching kids the basic of the basics of computers. And it even talked about binary zeros and ones and how computers work. Um, and I just got hooked there. Um, and then um, that book, I think even showed like the very beginnings of like basic and I don't remember exactly what played out after that, but I just got hooked and I started learning how to program before I even had a computer. Um, I had gotten, I think I got a book on basic or something like that. Um, and it helped that my friends had a computer. And then, then I went to a summer camp and they had, I remember they, I went to a summer camp and they had a pet, uh, now for those of you that don't remember, like the pet was like this huge machine. Well, huge relative to the PCs we have today. Um, not huge relative to like, say, the ENIAC. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a whole different level of huge. 
And, you know, it was a green screen um, computer and, and it had basic on it. And I remember I went during the summer for kind of a computer course um, that they had for kids uh, on the pet. Um, and, and the pet was the precursor to the Vic 20 by Commodore, was. right? It was. Yeah. And it was, it was an inter- it was kind of like the iMac of the generation. <laughs> yes. you know, it was the, it was the integrated green screen with the keyboard. Um, and all those, uh, 1980s curves on it or 1970s curves. Yeah. You, you got it. That, that was in, in those days. So then I, um, I, I was using the pet and I, I was getting really into it. And my family was noticing, my mom was noticing that I was really into this computer thing. I just kept talking about it. And I would go to my friend's house as many times as I could who had the TRS-80. Uh, <clears throat> and then what happened is my uncle took notice and he actually had this premium home computer at the time called a VIC-20. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they, 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 they actually, I think had a monitor, uh, with the VIC 20 hooked up to it and the VIC 20, you know, had the tape drive, uh, which and is 22 actually, characters across. It was. Yeah. And it was 4.77 megahertz and 4k of Ram with, uh, you could get like an 8k extend, expansion card. And I think I remember what happened. I think I was nine. Oh, okay. So I was nine years old. I really wanted to get a computer. I reached this point where I really wanted a computer. And I was trying to convince my family to even get me like a learning computer, which wouldn't have been as good. You know, they had like these learning toy computers, but Mm -hmm. I just wanted one so badly. And, you know, I'm slightly impulsive. Really? (laughs) Yes. Yes. You might find that hard to believe. (laughs) So I just wanted one as badly as possible and would have done anything to get one. And then what happened is this Timex Sinclair came out, um, which was, you know, like $100 for a computer. And it was just, you know, this small keyboard. And and I forget what it was that in the UK, there was another version of the same thing, but it wasn't called the Timex Sinclair. Um And I really wanted that. And I was kind of like trying to bargain my birthday gifts, you know, like I I will take this for my birthday and and, and Hanukkah. I grew up in a Jewish family and I was really trying to like bargain for it. And then what happened was my uncle decided to sell his big 20 and my family actually ended up buying buying it for me. Oh, nice. I think they paid $400 at the time and that was for the computer and the tape drive. And I had a black and white TV and that began, you know, now I had my own computer, you know, now it was like a whole different ball game. So what would I do? The whole world was Uh, open. The whole world was open and I would program for like 12 hours a day. I mean, I, it was crazy. Like on, and I mean, even during like a school night, like I would go to sleep (laughs) And then I would like get up at like 10 o'clock at night and I would program to like four in the morning. My, my family didn't know about it. So of course. Don't, leave those, don't leave those computers in the room, parents. Um, and yeah, so and, and at those days, what you used to do is get like computer magazines like Byte and Compute. I'm sure you remember those. Shows. I do. And, you know, my dad used to find it shocking that I would sit there and program for like eight hours just to get like a line go across the screen. <laughs> you know, because, because back in those days, I mean, that's what it was like. You would you you would basically go and you would, uh, you know, you'd get these magazines and you would just spend all this time writing it all in. And at some point you, you probably would delete it. I mean, you might save it to the tape drive. Um, so I was a big fan of like Byte and Compute, but especially Compute. I, I would get Compute like religiously. That, that, that was the that was the deal. I remember uh, if there was a typo in the in the program in the back of Compute, you wouldn't know for like two months, and you pour over the code, you making sure you typed it in right, even though it didn't work, and then trying to figure out because the the uh, the bug was always in th- those blocks of of. Uh, machine code that they had put in the last, you know, section that, you know, to get around basics limitations. Oh yeah. So there's right. no way to like, debug it. You'd be like poking. Yeah. yeah. They'd, have, they'd, have, they'd have like a section that was just like an array of numbers. Yeah. That, that were poked be, into memory. 
Yeah. Yeah. People today don't, you know, don't that are coming up today just don't know what that whole experience was like. I mean, how many people today have gone and just like copied three pages of, of, you know, small type code from a magazine just to see an outcome. I mean, it was, it was, but you learned a lot. I mean, that was what was, that was what was really interesting. And then it really promoted you to do the same kind of thing. So I remember one of the things I would do on the big 20, um, I was always starting these games that would only go part of the way and that would get frustrated. And I, I sometimes, I would like delete the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but I remember one of the things you used to be able to do on the Vic 20 was you could reprogram the character set. Yeah. So like I had made Hebrew letters um, and I remember showing that to my family. I'm like, look, now I have Hebrew letters. And they were just like, what? <laughs> you know? But they're going left to right. <laughs> and my, my dad just never understood like why I would spend all this time, you know, just, <laughs> just, you know, seemingly crazy amounts of time for, for what appeared to be like a very little outcome. Anyway, the way math so works is starting to make a lot of sense, actually, now. <laughs> nice. So um, I also got really into games at the time. So like the Vic 20 had a ton of different games um, like Scott Adams Adventures. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, some of the games were on cartridges and, and they were written in machine language and you couldn't do anything with them. That was the term we used back then, machine language, if it wasn't like basic. Right. But then there were games you could get on tape drives that you could kind of load in and, 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 you, and you could even modify them. Um, so I remember one time I was trying to impress my friends and I took a game and I actually modified the title and I just put my name on it. <laughs> and my friends were like, wow, you made that game? And it was a game that was absolutely not something that I made. And it was called, it was called Blue Meanies from Outer Space. I remember the name and I, and I actually went and just modified the title and I had like Glenn Block in there. That's funny. It was. We used to, uh, we would get these games in basic. I remember one was Telling Guard, though. I don't know whether. Oh, it was... I love Telling Guard. I remember Telling Guard. You could go in and change the random number generator to give you all eight teens for your <laughs> yes. strength and decks and all that. And that was our big way to cheat. I don't know why we didn't like give ourselves 99, but you know, because 18. You got a good memory. Yeah. Better than me. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So I stuck with the Vic 20, and then that led. So here's where things really took like the next level. So after that, I got a TRS-80 color computer. Um, and that had a lot more richness to it um, in terms of the kind of stuff you could do with it. There sure. I actually had like a disk drive, which I'm talking about a floppy disk drive, no hard drive yet. Yeah, five and a half um, inch floppy disk. Exactly, five and a half inch floppy. But... It had some really great games on it. I remember one that I loved on the TRS-80 color computer was the Sands of Sahara, I think it was called. Wow. It was like an adventure game where you're like in Egypt. And, you know, it was kind of like the precursor to almost like the King's Quest kind of games. I mean, way, way earlier than that. Sure. But I loved those challenges. And there I started doing some more serious programming. Um, I, um, I started to, like, I try to build this sub game. I must've been working on this thing like eight months. Now I used to get angry at my computers. I don't do that like, like anymore now, now, cause I'm like an adult. I used to really get angry at it and like yell at it. You, you know, um, many of the people listening follow you on Twitter. So we know that's not true. <laughs> Well, I don't, I don't uh, get angry to the, at my computers the way that I used to <laughs> put it that way. I'm, I'm a little bit more restrained. <laughs> and one time in a fit of rage, I went and deleted this game that I had been working on like six months. Wow. It was like a, it was like a submarine game. And here's what happened. Like I didn't have any money and I had friends that would go and buy like a sub game. So I would see it and I'd be like, well, I can't buy that, but maybe I can make one. I mean, it's just completely crazy. Sure. So, so I would, you know, try to make this really elaborate thing. And then, then I remember one thing I remember about that game was that the Coco wasn't that fast at drawing things. Like if you just used like basic. Sure. So remember, I was really excited that I actually used assembler to build like this routine that would kind of copy, draw the screen in the background and then bring it instantly to the foreground. Cause you could do like, paging right um and yeah 
So that was, that was, <laughs> that was, that was until you deleted it and you rage quit it. Yeah, exactly. So then what happened was, so around this time, th- this is going to sound really, really geeky, but I found Radio Shack and Radio Shack was pushing because I got my color computer. Yeah. But Radio Shack also had like these Tandy 1000s that were coming around, uh, which was kind of like their version of the PC. Mm-hmm. Um, I started to become a regular at Radio Shack and I would just stand there on the PC because I was kind of starting to outgrow my um, my color computer. And I would stand there at Radio Shack and start writing kind of code on on this Tandy 1000 it was like a GW basic or whatever right right and people would come around even like adults and they'd be like what do you think of this computer I'm like oh yeah it's great I became almost like a salesperson <laughs> um I would I would spend hours and hours at Radio Shack I mean it, it's it's my my mom would just like drop me off there she felt it was a safe sure environment and it was and it was a good thing but here's what happened so around that time you know in those days we didn't have the internet we had BBSs mm-hmm. I didn't know anything about that, but this guy came to me and he worked at Radio Shack and he was, you know, probably like 18 or 20 and he kind of had a hacking challenge for me, which I won't speak about, but (laughs) in order, you know, but he said to me, I'll give you this modem. I'll buy you this modem. Now modems then were not cheap. Um, but this was, and this was, you know, people today don't even think about modems, but this was like, this was not the acoustic coupler, which was the older generation where you had to actually like put the receiver inside of it. This was a white box that you basically would call up a BBS and then you would listen for the dial tone and then you would just press the connect button right? and you would connect. So that got me into that was like my gateway into the bulletin boards and I tried to kind of hack this thing that he wanted me to do and it worked out I couldn't do it but he's kind of said I'll give you an A for an effort you can just keep the modem nice um and so then I got into the BBS world and then I had a whole different reason to stay up (laughs) till you know four o'clock in the morning um I became the avenger uh that was my handle. that was your moniker (laughs) yes that was my handle and I got really into bulletin boards, um, and I was wasn't running one at that point. I was just like calling them, um, and you know, if you could wink at the right person when you were on a bulletin board, because bulletin boards, well, first off, like back in those days, I had a three hundred baud modem initially. So just to describe what that means, it's like I could see the cursor running when I would, you know, connect. I would connect to a to a bulletin board uh, like CompuServe, for example, was a very uh, common service that was out there that was established. Uh, but then people had their own private boards, and yeah, I mean, it was a whole different ball game. You literally like watch the cursor go all the way down the screen to finally say like log in, and back in those days, there was like the early form of graphics, which was just like ANSI yeah. characters. So depending on how, you know, detailed the screen was, you could be waiting a long time. Um, pe- people today just don't know what that experience was like. They don't. They, it's interesting because Hollywood still thinks that the internet works that way. <laughs> if you watch, if you watch movies. But uh, yeah, so I do true. remember that. Yep. <laughs> So when did you get your first job? Well, so if I go a little bit further forward, um, eventually I got an IBM PC XT. And I remember that was, I think we paid $1,400. I must have been like 12 or 13. It might have even been like a bar mitzvah present. It was like $1,400 for an, and this was a clone because of, Sure, IBM was even more. It was like two thousand bucks. So this was like going into. I used to live in New York City. This was going to one of those. I mean, it was kind of felt like the movie Gremlins. You go, to one of, <laughs> you go to one of these like computer shops, you know, buried like underground practically, and you know, somebody there who I think the guy was Chinese would sell you a, you know, a computer, which was a clone. And back in those days too, by the way, you used to be able to assemble computers yourself, which is less common nowadays. People still do it. Um, 
but it was very common then that you would just assemble your own motherboard and all that other stuff. Um, but anyway, yeah, fourteen hundred dollars. Uh, it was an IBM PC XT Turbo, which I recently <laughs> found out that the Turbo button actually uh, runs the computer at the normal speed, and when the Turbo button is up, the computer is actually running at half speed. And and mental that that didn't fit my mental model, but I found that. <laughs> Um, because they were too fast. Yeah. You know, eight megahertz was, was too quick. Um, well, there's all that software that was written expecting the, the 4.77 yes. clock hertz exactly. and you'd run exactly. an old game or not that old then, but, and everything would just go. Whoop. You got it. So it was a uh, 640 K of Ram. Um, actually it didn't even have extended. I think it was just 640 K of Ram. It was two, five and a half floppies. And it was CGA, four color. Um, but that was where I got into like GW Basic. And then what happened is I had a friend, um, I think I was like, uh, how old was I? Probably like 14. I, I met a friend whose dad was actually a computer programmer. Oh. And his dad was trying to force his son to program and his son didn't want to program. But when I would be there, I'd be all open. Like I'd go. So this guy created the software for the New York City taxi meter, which oh, was okay. a big deal back then. He had created the first one. Um, it was a huge, a huge amount of money. It was a huge deal. Um, he saw that I was really interested in programming, and he kind of got me to start programming in C. Um, and he gave me a TRS-80 Model One, a three at the time, um, which, you know, maybe you'd think was a step back from the XT, but I ended up getting a TRS-80 Model 3. Um, but he started to teach me C. He gave me this book on Learn C. Um, and at some point he tried to get me to like drop out of high school to go, to go, <laughs> to go, to go, to go work for him. But, but anyway, my first job was actually on the VIC-20. This guy- Really? The VIC- no, TRS-80 Color Computer. This guy hired ah. me to write this architectural software for him, and he paid me $180. And I have no idea how much I was taking for a ride on doing that, but I actually did build it for him. It was like this drawing program, simple architectural drawing diagram. Wow. And I think he paid me $180. So that was really like my first ever computer job. But uh, I hate to admit it, but I ultimately did work at Radio Shack. <laughs> <laughs> when I was like 17. Do you still have the uh, shirt? No. Uh. I, I don't want to think about those days. But <laughs> <laughs> but uh but I I did work there. Um so I guess that was kind of my first computer job, but in high school, um a little bit later in high school or maybe it was like right when I graduated that summer. I actually got my first real, what I would consider a computing job, working for a computer store. But it's different than Radio Shack because Radio Shack, it's like all you did was, you know, you took like a Tandy 1000 and you sold it. But you might also be selling like a coax cable. So, sure. you know, we would all get excited when we would sell a computer because there was a very small commission that you would get out of it. <laughs> um, but yeah, but it was not really working that much with computers. But when I got the job at this other place, which I totally don't even remember the name, they were the kind of place where, um, you know, you would go to buy a computer and they would sell computers and they would assemble them. So that really got me more into kind of the assembly of computers. And, and, you know, I think we did some custom programming within the office, basically not like got paid for it. Sure. Um, so then, um, you know, I went away to school I gra- in high school. So the other thing was like in school, I was always underachieving in my classes. Well, you were up was, until 4 a.m. every day. And I was always thinking about computers, even when I was in class. Sure. Um, you know, I was the computer. I was one of the few super computer nerds. Um, in school, we had the Apple twos, uh, which I'm sure you remember those. Of course. And, so, you know, I would do whatever I could, whenever I could. This is even in elementary school to to get in and, and use those Apple II's. And I remember we had Logo, which was kind of the programming language where you move around the turtle. Yep. Um, and, you know, that that actually now thinking I'm, I'm a little bit all over the place, but that was probably also paralleled as one of the 
programming experiences that I had, um, that, that may even have been the first time I ever, uh, you know, I ever actually got in touch with any kind of programming was, was using logo. That we were many, many people learned and still actually used, uh, to teach kids programming. Yeah, it was, it was, well, you know, it was really simple and it had a concept that was easy for kids to attach to, which is like, Hey, this thing's going to move around. Right. Right. Um, and it was fun. A turtle was fun, fun for kids. But yeah, I learned, I learned a lot through logo. Um, anyway, so my first real, real job was, so when I went to, I went away to college and I worked in the computer lab. You kind of probably say that was my first job, but we didn't really get much money there. And that was just like, you know, I was that guy. You yeah. Know, Can you yeah. put this for me? Can you do that for me? Blah, 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 blah. Um, it, and then there was a period where I kind of, although I continued to hack on the side and I ultimately did have my own bulletin board, which was called the Forbidden Tower, by the way. And I became a, <laughs> I became a sysop, which was, you know, system operator. And I had this whole empire at night, basically. Um, I had grown and had quite a bit of influence in, you know, this, this online community. And this is before the internet existed. It was just amazing. And people were very helpful, too, which sure. was really cool. But anyway, that was like my alter ego in, in the AM, um, <laughs> running my own bulletin board. Computer nerd by day. Oh, wait, wait. Computer nerd by night, too. That's right. <laughs> exactly. 24-7. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, just, it just came out in different, in different ways. Um, so anyway, I, I went through a period where I really wasn't sure that computers – like my dad, when I was very young, used to say to me, this is what you're going to do. He saw – by the time I was 10, he was just like, this is your calling. Like you could see how much self-motivated passion I had for learning this thing and living it and breathing it. Uh, but there was a period when I wasn't sure that that was what I really wanted to do. I, I was going to computer science for school. But there was a period when I came out of school where I wasn't really working as much in computers, though I still had my online empire, of you know, competing with like Jay-Z no. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of size. But um, then what happened was I got a job at my mom's company. My mom used to work for this company. This is in my 20s uh, called Getting to Know You and Getting to Know You. They were the largest a uh, compiler of new homeowner data. And they had a phone book that they used to send to you when you moved into, um, when you moved into an, a house. Uh, they also ended up acquiring this other company called Welcome Wagon, which was doing the same kind of thing. Sure. Was like yeah. all for new homeowners. And they had a job in their operations department. Um, so I got a job working with other operators. This was in my mid twenties. And there, it was, oh, that was my, that was my, uh, face to face with an AS 400, which I'm trying to forget as fast as possible. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, you know, so an AS 400 is a mid range. It's not a mainframe, right, but right. it's close enough in terms of experience. It might as well be a mainframe. I mean, for all intents and purposes for somebody using it, it feels like a mainframe, yeah. Yeah. gigantic computer, big, gigantic tape drives and things like that. But they ran their business on the AS 400. And they had PCs as well. Um, we used to use Rumba, which was this emulator for, or, or this terminal emulator for connecting to an AS400. <laughs> so I got this. So that was my first real job in computing was working in data processing. And what we used to do is we would have to process all this data that was coming in from all these different places where we would get data about new homeowners. So the way that getting to know your work, I mean, there was no real... Like the internet was there then. It's not like there was um, there was no internet. There was the internet at that point. I think this was around the time of the Pentium 486s. Oh yeah, but um, but it was still you know still very young, and um, they would have to gather a lot of the data manually. They would have to send people out to like the local off you know like the local city offices to find the homeowner the new homeowners and i think some of the data they would even key in they would hire people like all around the country to key this data in so we would have to process it so what we used for data processing was dbase which i had learned in college um 
And so at this point, you know, my life was pretty mundane as far as being exciting from a technology perspective, because I was in this department of people that had been there for like 20 years and they were like excited about it. You know, and they talk about, you know, remember when we did this data job back, you know, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, my God, I'm not going to stay here forever. Um, I'm not going to be that guy. <laughs> Well, it was just because I knew how to program and I want, I was like, if I'm going to be in computing, I got to do more than this. Yeah. Um, and so the AS 400, I think came after, there was like the system 36, I don't remember the name of it, but there was another model before the AS 400 and they would tell stories about how much better the AS 400 was than the system. <laughs> this. And I, was, I was just like, kill me now. But so we would do all this work around processing the data. And this led to programming for me, and here's why. So they were doing everything manually, and there was this one guy who used to work with me in the department, and he was the guy who was kind of like the head honcho who knew, he knew some D-based scripts, and, and he had built some scripts to help them. Um, but he also used it kind of to keep himself uh, in, a, in a secure position. Sure. Like, I'm the guy. And he would make them just wait. Like if they needed a script or something, he would kind of make them just wait. And having been a programmer almost my whole life, though maybe not working professionally, sure. I just look at this guy and be like, this guy knows nothing, but he knows more than they know. So I went out of my way to start playing with DBase. Like I already knew DBase and I started writing some more advanced kind of scripts that would even like his stuff was, you know, do this manual step run this script, do this manual step, run this script, do this step. And I had this dream in my head, like all of this can be automated where you just do like one command and just walk away and come back like 40 minutes later and everything is done. And I started teaching the other people in the department about how to use DBase and how to program. I was like, you don't have to be like, you know, a, uh, a slave to this other guy who I won't name. Um, you can do it. And I started showing them some basic stuff and I started building more and more D based scripts to help automate the department. And I ended up automating the whole thing. And this guy hated me. I'm sure. And, and he used to look at me and I used to tell him flat out and be like, I'm going to, you know, I had <laughs> to put it this way, but I used to be like, I'm going to take you down because I'm like, dude, like, you know, cool stuff, but you're kind of like hiding it and you're being difficult and all of that. And, and I also was like, honestly, I, I hate to tell this to you, but you're not that good. <laughs> like you're not as good as you portray yourself. Sure. Um, yeah. So that got a ton of notice, even from the VP in the company that like, wow, I helped automate the entire thing. And I literally got to the place I wanted to be. And what was a real smack in the face for the other guy is we then had this huge project and my boss came to me and was like, I want you to do it. And it was dealing with, I think the company's name was First Logic. It was this postal software because we would have to take these addresses and scrub them and assign zip codes and all this other stuff. It was not, you know, what I would consider the most exciting and fun. The one good thing about it, though, from a lesson perspective in terms of computing is it was a job that put me very close to data. So I really learned the ins and outs of like reading data, manipulating data, processing, you know, different types of data feeds. And, 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 and that has still helped me to this day. Absolutely. The, the, there's so much more ETL work than people, you know, it wasn't called ETL back then. But, you know, what, what people do to process all these different, you know, forms of data and, and to homogenize them so it looks like one set of data, all that's uh, – well, that's a lot of work. And I think, you know, with the internet, we're thinking, what do you mean I can't get it as an RSS feed or as an OData feed? It, it should just magically be there already. <laughs> How about a COBOL copy book? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Mostly what you dealt with then were like delimited, you know, SDF, like fixed field kind of things. Um, and every once in a while you would get something like some type of COBOL thing. Um, and, and you didn't have the libraries that you have today too. So you really had to jump through hoops. Um, and that's how you learn. You'd be like, Oh, I want to process this COBOL copy book. I have to learn the COBOL copy book format so I can write some code, uh, in DBase, um, to read it in. Um, we used to get the, uh, we used to get data from a bunch of different municipalities when I worked at a real estate company and, and it came on, uh, uh um, tape. 
So we had a, you know, reel to reel tape drive that would read it in. I'm like, what? Yeah. Yeah. We had one of those giant tape drives. Uh, I mean, this thing was a monster too. This thing looked like, I don't know, must've weighed like several tons. Yeah. And it was like, it was like big as a kitchen table. Uh, and it was the same kind of thing. These two giant, and make all this noise too. When you, you know, like when, when it reads the tape, it's serious. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it would make that noise. Like I'm ready, you know, like, whoosh. <laughs> um, so that actually led to my first serious programming job because what happened was that got all this attention and they had hired me at a really low rate. I sure. remember I was, I remember exactly how much I was making when I got hired. I got hired at like $19,000 a year. Um, and this was 1996. Uh, I make a little bit more than that now, but, um, you know, they were, you know, they were, they were giving me the family rate. But, sure. <laughs> but, what happened after that was I was like, okay, I can go much further than this. And I mean, you know, I have much more leverage now with this company. And I kind of went to the VP and was like, well, I want to do something else. And he's, and I, and I had been making friends with a guy, his name was Rob Mulligan, who worked over in the programming area where they did the real programming, which was all in C and uh, C plus plus. And I had my early C days. So I started kind of and and I had now, because I had been to college and done CS, I mean, I had done Pascal. I had done a bunch of uh, languages. Um, I ended up doing Fortran in high school, which I, I hate. But, but um, you know, I became really friends with him. And he was very much encouraging me to keep with my program, you know, to get more into programming. Um, he knew that I had been a programmer from background. But after this success story in MIS department, I was able to go to the VP and say, look, I want to do something completely different and you got to pay me a lot more. And he was like, you know, how much more do you want? And, but, but they were open. Right. And I ended up overnight doubling my salary. Now I wasn't making a ton at the time, but still, sure. that, that was a nice accomplishment coming out of kind of the MIS operations. Now the frustrating thing there was for my manager. So my job there had two parts. There was doing all this data stuff and he had been like the, a the AS 400 administrator and he had dreams of kind of me replacing his job, uh, which I had no dreams of. Sure. And, and he would try to entice me to the exotic life of the AS 400 administrator, uh, which, which I, I, I wasn't buying it. So he was the one who had a hard time with me moving into programming. I'm sure. But um, but that led to my first real programming job. So I got that job and I, yeah, I think I was making 36 or 37,000 a year at the time. And I was really excited, uh, cause that was quite a jump from, from, from 19, it was 38. And I moved into, um, programming where my day-to-day -day job shifted from D base to writing with C. Um, it was still the same kind of thing, manipulating data, but there we would do much more, we had a Btrieve database mm -hmm. uh, for the, many people here may not even know what that is. <laughs> it's a non-relational record oriented database, but it was very fast. And our database, I think, was five gigs, which was huge. Enormous at the, at the time. Yeah, enormous at the time. Um, and we used to have to, we built like our own data warehouse and all this stuff on top of Btrieve. Um, but what was nice about Btrieve is it had really good low-level APIs for C. And it was just really, really fast. And our queries were pretty simple. Like we would have queries around things like zip code, demographics, and other stuff. But it was not the level of sophistication of the kind of queries that, that you have to write today. Uh, and if it was, we would have to write custom code for it because there was no database that we were using other than Btrieve, which meant you, you know, the, the nice thing about record-oriented DB is you can be really fast. DBase is a record-oriented DB, but you end up having to write a ton of stuff on top of it to achieve the kind of things that you want. It's almost like the map reduce of the day in, in, in to some degree. Well, you know, uh, everything old becomes new again, so yeah. 
Yeah, and I actually built my first data warehouse. So one of the projects I had to do there was we had this process that literally would take like 15 hours. Like a customer would call and say, I want to do an ad campaign to these zip codes and for these genders and for people that are living, you know, that have, you know, this big of a family with this kind of annual salary. And that would take us like 15 hours using Btree because we had this five, I don't remember if it was a five million record database. It was huge at the time. Um, so I got into reading a bit about like Ralph Kimball and, 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 you know, data warehousing. And I built my own kind of mini data warehouse that took that query from like 18 hours, literally to like five minutes, uh, or three minutes. Um, and that coincided with learning about visual basic actually, because around that time, VB, they used VB3 in some parts of the company. So I had started to look at VB and then VB4 came out and VB4 was a considerable, considerate, considerable is not even a word, a considerate uh, upgrade from VB3. Um, and I saw it and I was like, this is the future. Like who wants to write these little console apps? You're going to be like building real windows. Windows apps, but doing it using a much simpler language. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's how I was making some money. I remember spending 99 bucks for a VB learning edition thing that came with like a, you know, they don't do this as much today, but came with like a book and VB, you know, a cut down version of VB4. It was yeah. Like, yeah. Um, and I started writing VB, you know, on the side. And when I built that data warehousing thing, originally I wrote it in C. But then, uh, so I wrote the data warehousing algorithm in C that built the warehouse, but I ended up building the UI in VB. Um, and I didn't know where that would bring me, but my next job after that was as a VB programmer. I left that company after being there like 18 months. And then I got in a really exciting and stressful position working in financial services where they had been using access and I came in as the, I'm going to help these people go to VB <laughs> um, and VB six, I think was around at that time. Cause back in those days, VB moved pretty fast. It was like it, well, it did. Yeah, every year or so you got like a new version. Um, so you're and, saying VB is the node of the day. <laughs> yeah, maybe is that the parallel you're making. It was definitely the hotness. Uh, <laughs> it was definitely much easier. Uh, I, so when I worked at Getting to Know You, my first programming job, we had a guy there who was brilliant, who was designing a Windows apps using the Windows SDK. And I remember him telling me that like his first Windows program was something like a million lines of code, like his first serious program. That's a lot of code. It's a lot of code. So VB just made it so much easier. Um, and, you know, after that, I would do VB programming for like six years. Wow. Um, I became a real like, guru. I don't want to call myself a self-appointed guru, but I got really into VB and I, you know, picked up, of course, Dan Appleman's books yep. and Bruce, Mc Bruce McKinney. I, I used to carry around the hardcore VB book. I mean, it was like that became my Bible. I thought that book was so awesome. Um, and ultimately that led to my friend Rocky Latka. Uh, because I read his BB business objects. That was like a defining book in my programmer career. And many people's and many people's. And then I had the fortune to meet Rocky in 1998 at a rocks conference. Um, and he encouraged me to write. Um, and now I'm just about to publish my first book, which is very, very exciting. And kudos to Rocky, because he's definitely one of the people that made me want to write. That's awesome. Now, you, uh, I think I saw on Twitter that it's it's done, done. Going to it's, the now finally, it's now finally done. It's gone into production. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah, it's, and it's, what's the name of the book? It is called, it's not a short name. <laughs> it's called, uh, it's called Designing Evolvable Web APIs with ASP.NET. Um, so anybody who knows me on the Twitterverse knows I've had this kind of long-standing interest in kind of rest, and I worked on WCF Web API, which became ASP.NET Web API. 
Um, and this book is basically written with other people who worked on Web API, as well as a bunch of external advisors who have been building Web API type apps uh, using, you know, in the real world before we ever built our technology. And they worked with us and helped us to build it. So it's a pretty interesting book that, you know, the authors lived in four different countries. So that was an interesting challenge. And nice. Time zones. <laughs> But uh, yes, we just finished. Well, thanks for being on.